1976, I wanted to be here. I was only four years old. <laughs> and my dream has become a reality today. Can you imagine a little boy from a small island you have never heard of in Soweto, in Johannesburg? When we think of creativity, we usually think of these great men. Da Vinci, Einstein, Picasso, Steve Jobs. These great minds have changed the world. Africans, we are lucky. We have other creative minds that are focusing their efforts, wealth, and education to make our continent a better world. Men like Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, Barry Siegel, Jeffrey Sachs, Paul Farmer, and others are working with their teams to make Africa a great place. Of course, we are grateful and to have them to help us. Today, I would like to introduce to you the less known creative minds that are also solving Africa's problems. The women. The pygmies. We, refer, we wrongly refer, refer to them pygmies, but these are native. They call themselves first citizens and children. These are the people I know. They have no formal education. They lack the modern resources we use to solve problems. And these are the people I work with. These are the people that have, have been solving problems we are facing with Amani Global Works, an organization that I founded a few years ago that is based between New York and Iju Island, that I'll talk to you in a few minutes, to bring health care in rural, rural Africa. Our hospital is based in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo on Iju Island. I am from Iju Island. I was lucky to leave Iju Island and get education. But when I returned to Iju a few years ago, the situation was the same. There were no roads, no electricity, no running water, no sewage. Iju Island is large and remote. In 1978, we only were 38,000 of us. Less than 40 years later, we were 250,000. Huge population growth. When we first began, we didn't have much. With only a few thousand dollars and a two-bedroom shack that we used as our medical center, we had no other choice than harness the full creativity of our community. When we thought we were ready to build the, med the first medical center, we had the entire community behind us. They were carrying stones, bringing sticks. They had no money, but they knew that they had sticks, they could build something. But we realized something. Women were excluded. Then, Jackie, a woman who doesn't read, doesn't know how to read and write, a mother of nine, came to me with three of her friends and said, this project is so important to us and we want to be part of it. Can you imagine in a society where women don't do nothing? They just stay home cooking? We knew that we need to take a different path. It's so easy to bring in money build infrastructure, hire the men, don't get involved in local politics, and leave, write reports, and show on TV and present to funders. But we needed to change things. We called the men. Now, this is where you can wisely use alcohol.
We bought few liters, gallons of local beer. The men didn't know what we were looking for. <laughs> and then I told them, in order for us to continue this project, women had to be part of it. The men were angry. But thanks to alcohol, please don't tell the government that I said that alcohol is good. <laughs> but in this particular situation, it helped. And this advice came from the women. So, two things happened. The men said, okay, we'll let these women be part of it, but on one condition. They will have to just work on this one building in one month, and after that, that they need to disappear. So, we were lucky. First, our first medical center was finished faster, and second, the women knew that they had the men's support. And here they are, carrying stones, happy, laughing, happy to be part of this project. Another way we work on Iji Island to empower the communities. When we arrived, I took with me a few nurses to Pygmies, the first citizens' villages. The nurses didn't want to touch them. The pygmies, the native citizens, the indigenous people, don't exist, although we see them. These are the people who anoint my uncles, who are the kings of Iji and other kings around on the mainland. These are the same people that when you arrive to Iji or other places in Eastern DRC, they are surround the king. The king lives in the middle of the, of the pygmies. But these are the same people that have no right to mourn. These are the same people that have no health care right. These are the people who have no land. These are the people who are owned with the land. These are the same people who have no right even to pay taxes. These are the same people who cannot be arrested because they don't exist. So, as the only trained doctor, in the area, I held these two kids. And by the way, Idri has the lowest life expectancy, 25 years of age. And this community, the pygmies, live even less than that. So these two children died. But I made it clear, from now on, the indigenous people will be treated for free at our medical center. Second, they will receive prefer preferential treatment. If a doctor is there and a nurse, they will be seen by the doctor and the rest will be seen by the nurse. Third, we set it right. Whoever didn't want to touch or treat the pygmies will not be employed by Amani. Once we establish those ideals, those goals that are, are our, at the heart of Amani Global Works, we were making change. Problems were being solved, opportunities identified, and the link with the community was strengthened. And what, what was happening? The community started to trust us. They realized that we were listening to them, and we realized that they had great ideas. Slowly, people started coming. Why don't we expand our medical center? And the women, those who were excluded, were the ones making all those decisions. And here, they're telling me what we needed to do to make that a beautiful place. It's not because they told me. It's not because we are poor, we are destitute, forgotten, marginalized, that we don't, we, we don't need a beautiful thing. So they knew that we can make it happen. When we were ready, to build and enough funds were, uh, were raised to expand the medical center, these women, together with the entire community and indigenous people, suggested an, a great architect and builders who, were, who have built this new hospital that we now have. Now imagine we're able to move from a 30 square meter shack to 2,000 square meter of buildings. 
just because of the community, working together, listening to the community. And this is the new facility. And I'm very proud to say we now have full solar energy that runs this hospital 24 hours. <laughs> we'll run all the medical equipment and people will receive the best care that you can also receive in Johannesburg and you can receive in, in New York. People will be, will be getting the same care here and even the indigenous people. And I'm also proud to say that we have for the first time satellite internet on the island. <clears throat> my final story is my favorite one. A powerful landowner around the clinic broke his commitment to us and decided to plant sugar cane. S I hope you, some of us know that sugar cane plantation can be a, the best place for mosquitoes to grow, to, 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 to thrive. And these transmit malaria. And more and more people were getting sick at the hospital. And children who lived in the community, you know, they still, we are still learning how they hand hygiene. They will just jump in the, in the sugar cane plantation, cut a sugar cane and just eat it. We had so many cases of cholera and diarrheal diseases. We were becoming a danger, a public health danger, instead of being a, a life-saving institution. We went to see the authorities but we weren't making progress. Then we decided to shut the clinic down. To my surprise, the news spread into the community and went even further to the indigenous people. A group of pygmies, the indigenous people, came to me and said, this is our only place, this is our hope, this is a place where we feel welcome. We have to protect it. I didn't understand then what they meant. Until the next morning, another group came and said, we finished the work, now the hospital is safe. <laughs> I was lost. <laughs> Until I got to the hospital, and there was no more sugar cane. <laughs> Not even one stalk of sugar cane. Imagine this community of excluded, non-existent people that not, are not even allowed to be arrested. They couldn't speak for themselves. And these are the people who saved the island, who saved the island's hope. They couldn't speak before, but now, by empowering the creativity of people, by listening to the voices of people inside the community, by working with them, we can unleash, unleash the, the, the creativity in powerful ways. And this is what happened with this community. I would like to finish by saying, maybe Africa still needs charity. And we are grateful for all these great minds, these great wealthy and educated people who are focusing on Africa. My point is simply that we have other solutions. We have other powerful ways we can solve Africa's problems, which are we need to empower the creativity of our people. We really do need to listen to the voices of people it doesn't matter if they're educated or not. We need to work with them. There is no shortage of creativity in Africa. We can accomplish so much if we only can listen to ourselves. And when people are empowered, there are no limits. Thank you. <laughs>